Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Catherine, and I work in curatorial and public engagement at UNSW Galleries. Uh, today, we're meeting on the unceded lands of the Bidjigal and Gadigal people. Um, at the Art Design Campus, we acknowledge the two language groups because um, we're actually situated on a boundary line. Um, for thousands and thousands of years, this place is underpinned by teaching, learning, creating, making, and has always been a site um, for the exchange of knowledge. And that's a sentiment that I like to think about um, in our programming at UNSW Galleries. Um, I'd like to extend my respects to First Nations people that are joining us today and acknowledge that sovereignty has never been ceded. Um, this afternoon, I'm really delighted to introduce Honorary Associate Professor Liz Williamson. Um, Liz is an internationally respected weaver, textiles artist and academic um, who's been creating since the late 1970s. Her recent weavings have referenced um, the tradition of woven rag rugs, the repair of cloth and the idea of making do, um, often weaving with materials that have been coloured um, by locally sourced eucalypts and plant dyes. And this has become a real focus for the project that's currently opening today um, at UNSW Galleries. Today, Liz will be discussing the history of eucalypts dye making in Australia, including the landmark research of Jean Carmen, who was the first to systematically document the colours of Australian eucalypts um, by testing over 450 species. And it's a quote from Carmen that Liz has used for the title of the keynote, um, which references um, this idea of colours hidden in their leaves. Um, please join me in welcoming Liz. Thank you, Catherine. That was a lovely welcome and welcome everybody. And thanks for that acknowledgement to the original owners of this land, Catherine. And I'd like to add that I feel very privileged to live in a country with such a rich indigenous fiber art tradition. So um, hidden in their leaves, as Catherine mentioned, it's this wonderful quote from Jean Carmen. I'll explain more about Jean uh, later when I get to the stage in the presentation about um, uh, earlier ex, um, experiments with eucalyptus dyes in Australia. But it gives an overview of the background research to, the presentation gives an overview of the background research I've undertaken for the Weaving Eucalyptus Project, which is, um, uh, as Catherine mentioned on, and um, will open this afternoon, and it's absolutely, I'm so delighted the way the exhibition is looking in the galleries. I'll mention a little bit of the development of the project and how eucalypts were disseminated around the Indian Ocean um, countries because um, a showing of the this project was in the Indian Ocean Craft Triennial last year in Perth. And uh, I'll show um, panels from the practitioners who have been involved in the project. So it's based on a paper that I gave last year to the IOTA conference called Weaving Eucalyptus, Local Colour from Indian Ocean Countries. That's online. I, I know it's online, but I don't have the link. But if you search for the Indian Ocean Craft Triennial Papers, it'll come up. And some of this research will be published 
I think next year in the Bloomsbury Encyclopedia of World Textiles Volume 4 on colour. So the, oh, sorry. <laughs> That's what I've just read. <laughs> Pretty much. So the exhibition, uh, the, this project started in August uh, 2019 with an invitation from Dr. Kevin Murray to participate in an exhibition titled Make the World Again. Many of you may know Kevin. He has been very inspirational and uh, uh, in the craft area, craft design area, and has done a lot of very innovative projects. He's currently editor of Garland magazine, but for many years curated great exhibitions and was director of Craft Victoria. So he asked um, practitioners to textiles. He was curating an exhibition of textiles to go to Vancouver in 2020, May 2020, which was sadly postponed because of the pandemic. But it was shown, it was online and it was shown at the Australian Tapestry Workshop in March, you know, December 2020 to March 21. Uh, so Kevin asked practitioners to look at how, um, what the capacity of textiles to connect cultures together was and create works that carried stories of cultural engagement and exchange. He also wanted us to think about different ways of practice and how we could go forward in establishing slightly different ways of practice. And this was before the pandemic, so he was very visionary. Because I think everybody involved in textiles know they have unique capacities to um, engage and represent various connections and memories. Sorry, I haven't asked, but can you hear me okay? Actually, I'm a little out of um, experience of lecturing in this room. I've given many lectures in the last 20 odd years in EGO too, but not for several years. Uh, so this, the work I exhibit in that exhibition was called Cultural Shadows, and it drew from the Weaving Eucalyptus Project. So I, I use Cultural Shadows because the first showing and the first um, 11 panels that I wove for this project were from Australia and India. And I've had long, well, clearly here, I've got a lot of um, friends who work with colouring textiles and also in India. And I have for many years been uh, a regular visitor to India. So this uh, was on the screen now is a quote from a review. And on the bottom of the, is the list of people whose panels were shown. And these were really the first that I wove. But I had a great response from everybody invi invited into the project. And I um, continued, decided to continue with it. So the initially it was uh, people in Australia only that I contacted. Uh, to dye two meters of silk fabric with a locally sourced eucalyptus using leaves, twigs, or barks. Um, I'll give a little bit of background to natural dyes because um, there may be people here that haven't actually dyed with um, natural plant material. But um, most plants have some color and you can extract that color by a number of different ways in a dye pot or in something called eco bundles where you wrap the material with the, fat, um, the, the plant material. You can use mordants uh, to enhance or change the colour and it helps the mordants are uh, chemical salts and they assist in the binding of the colour to the fabric. So I basically asked people to colour the silk fabric in any way they wished with a eucal uh, eucalyptus had to be, I liked the fact that it was local and to use any process that they wanted to. So, uh, so I've shown you the image of the first exhibition in Project Continued um, with the Indian Ocean Craft Triennial. I invited more people from Western Australia and from practitioners who lived in countries around the Indian Ocean. And I sourced those either from people I knew or from recommendations. So in the Indian Ocean Craft Training Exhibition, I had 70 panels. And now this year, I have 100. When I spoke to Jose de Silva, the director here, 
about showing the project in Sydney, I flippantly said, oh, I'll do 100 panels and what I need is a long wall. <laughs> so it's fantastic to see the exhibition here. Actually, is on two walls, but in a lovely gallery. So importantly, all the pa uh, practitioners in this project have had an interest in colour and cloth. Some haven't used natural dyes for many, many years, but have been very happy to be involved. So they have used, majority have used natural dyes fairly regularly, and most ha all have a concern for sustainability and an engagement with the environment. So here it is last year. I did, unfortunately, I didn't see it um, because it was in September last year. The work at the very end of the passageway is not mine. It's from um, a Thai artist. But the 70 panels were ex exhibited in this very wide passageway in three different sections. Uh, I didn't know at the time, but apparently it was one of the most uh, commented on uh, exhibitions and a lot of people wanted to buy the panels, which I was very pleased to hear at the end. Um, so the, the striking thing really is the colour, the range of colours. There's even more diverse colours now in the extended project and richer colours. But there is this lovely rhythm of different um, subtleties and colours reoccurring. So it is exhibited pretty much as I wove them. So there's a randomness about it. There's also a randomness about the way I've woven them because I've woven each panel individually, not thinking of where it was positioned in the uh, installation. So, and that some are quite plain because the fabric I received was plain. Others was very diverse. I did ask people to dye, to have some color variation in their dyeing. Like if you're a expert dyer, the goal is to have even color, but I was wanting uneven color. So they, they're all considerations that had to go into the selecting of how I weave. And it's essentially it's weft stripes in the weaving process. Um, so behind this uh, project is my research into the history of plant dyeing experiments in Australia since the British colony was founded here in 1788 to the present. I acknowledge Indigenous Australia's use of dyes and pigments for body decoration and baskets, but I've not researched these in depth. I've also focused on eucalyptus, and my understanding is that these were not used as part of their colouring for colouring purposes. Uh, so eucalyptus were unknown until Cook and Banks arrived. They are unknown to the, West, the Western world or the rest of the world, uh, until Cook and Banks visited in 1770, and they took back many species and many drawings of eucalyptus and other plants to the um, to Europe. And but it was really in 1788 they when um, Philip arrived, there was more research into eucalyptus. So. Uh, let me just take it. So when Philip arrived in 1788 um, with his convicts and animals and various things, he had a commission to investigate the advantages of local materials and plants. Uh, and in terms of textile dye history, this was 70 years before William Henry Perkins discovered accidentally an aniline dye uh, purple known as mauve which really is in 1866, which was really seen as the first synthetic dye that could be successfully replicated. So after uh, Philip, uh, sorry, Perkins' discovery, there are more chemical colours um, discovered and very rapidly the shift occurred from, from natural dyes to chemical dyes. And one of the big advantages was that chemical dyes were much more straightforward because they were in a container and they could just be used in a dye pot and you didn't have to go out and harvest and process and store and do the various things needed for natural dyes. So uh, with the settlement, if I think I thought about that with those 70 years before 
it may have been a bit longer uh, the, for, before chemical dyes arrived in Australia, but the, that lo, the settlement, the Sydney Cove settlement, the options for sources of dyes were Indigenous, locally grown, traded or imported. And the historical documents that I've uh, looked at show that most clothes, cloth and dyes were imported from Britain or India. And at that time, India was the world, absolute world leading country for their use of dyes and colouring components of textiles. And Europe was very trying very hard to copy them. <laughs> but that was India. And there was a huge amount of trade between Sydney, Cove and India, particularly Calcutta. So um, there's a few slides in here that have just come in quickly and they're not quite as the quality I um, like. The other thing that Philip brought to Australia were some um, cochineal bugs and prickly pears that he had collected in Brazil uh, on his way to Australia. And apparently he was interested in copying or observing their life cycle of the cochineal bugs, which lived on prickly pear plants. Um, he was interested in observing that during the voyage. And Joseph Banks drew up plans, drew up plans to establish a red dye manufacturing unit in Sydney Cove. At this time, cochineal red was used for soldiers' uniforms and was an extremely profitable commodity. Spain had most of the trade and the British were very interested in getting part of the action. So that was the reason for um, um, Philip bringing the cochineal bugs and the prickly pears to Sydney Cove. Unfortunately, they didn't survive in the climate here. So we know about prickly pear in Queensland, the problem it's been, but that was a later importation of prickly pear. But um, um, my view is that if those bugs had survived and the prickly pear had survived, we would have had a very different mm manufacturing sector here in, in terms of textiles in Australia because we would have had a um, natural dye manufacturing sector in this country, which we've really never had, and we've had a very particular textile industry. So my view is that it could have been vastly different, and I'll talk a bit about cochineal, the colour of cochineal, later. So these are my early uh, experiments from cochineal dyeing from 1997, which is when I started here at COFA teaching. So these would have been uh, uh, samples done for teaching purposes. And from 1997 to 98, to, yes, through 98. And you can see the various colours you can get from cochineal using different mordants, alum, copper, tin, or iron. Uh, so further on um, with historical eucalyptus dye experiments in Australia, the earliest record that I've found of native plant dyes being used in the colony was by Simeon Lord at his woolen mill in Botany, which opened in 1815. He wrote several letters to the then Governor Macquarie requesting mordants to be imported and de detailing his experiments with native flora. I've actually not read the letters, I've read about them only, so that's further project of further research at some stage. So at this time, uh, the government was interested in the efficiency of the dyes produced from woods and shrubs in the territory. He was known as the, oh, it's gone. It's something like the Baron of Botany. He was very aggressive. He was a convict and he was, he was given early uh, emancipation and he actually was sent here because he stole cloth. Oh. And then he, um, oh, that's right, it is here. He was known as the merchant of Botany Bay and regarded his work in cloth manufacturing and dyeing his greatest contribution to the development of the colony. So, yes, and his mill wove, fooled and dyed cloths uh, blankets and flannels, I imagine, are pretty rugged 
textiles, but he was uh, very determined. What I haven't found is what the particular plants are that he used, but he clearly was dying. Then, um, then the next important person is uh, Baron Ferdinand van Muller in from 1825 uh, to 1820. In the 1860s, he published a, uh, an account of uh, dies in of Australian plants. He was the director of the Botanical Gardens in Melbourne, and he's, I should read with the screen. <laughs> he was Victorian government botanist and director of the Melbourne Botanical Gardens, was first to publish an account of dyes from Australian plants, presenting his research at the Intercontinental Exhibition in Melbourne in 19, 1866 and 1867. He's a great advocate of eucalypts and was responsible for this dissemination around the world. He didn't actually do the experiments that he, which he published, but he drew on other people's research. But he does, um, I've, I've looked at his publication and it's very clear that he um, details the colour that can be sourced from this plant. Uh, in terms of the dissemination of eucalypts around the country, he, around the world, he was the one responsible for it and for a lot of the Indian Ocean countries that I have looked at closely. He, it was his promotion of eucalypts that, and his sending of eucalypt seeds around the world that um, allowed them to be spread pretty much everywhere. <laughs> yeah. And one reason he was a great advocate of eucalypts was um, that they were promote, he promoted them he promoted their planting to drain swampy environments that, that harbored mosquitoes in an attempt to combat malaria. Like a lot of eucalypts take a lot of water out of the earth. And that was the idea that they would be beneficial in draining swamps to kill off the malaria um, mosquitoes that carry malaria. So it's a little bit of circular. So, and he was very successful in that. So many of the Indian Ocean countries where my practitioners have come from that are involved in this project receive eucalyptus seeds and plants from Van Moore, and he discovered the beautiful soft reds of eucalyptus cinerea. So I'll mention it later, but there are a number of eucalypts that give a red, and one that's readily available is eucalyptus cinerea because it's the silver dollar leaf that we can all buy in every florist in every city. And that's very easy to extract a red color from cinerea. So the chemist Henry Smith and made and conducted experiments to test the potential of local plants, uh, local dye industry here, and both celebrated the wealth and diversity of local plants. They also did investigate, like generally they did investigations to see how eucalyptus could be used. And it was the oils that became the first small industry here rather than the dyes. But Maiden, Smith and Maiden did quite a lot of experience. And Maiden's um, uh, tests are in the Powerhouse Museum and the Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences. And in the current eucalyptus exhibition that's there, they do mention uh, through letters of discussion, I think it's between Smith and Maiden, about sources of eucalyptus. So they uh, published on, on, both of them published on eucalyptus dyes and both, as in many cases of the, these researchers, thought that there could be a very sound local industry here using local plants. Oh yes, but Maiden, uh, he published in his Useful Native Plants of Australia, including Tasmania, that was the title, with, and including Tasmania was in brackets. Uh, that was published in 1889. His chapter on dyes notes that Australia certainly does not appear to be a land which can boast its native vegetable dyes, but it is only fair to observe that practically nothing has been done in way of experiments. So <laughs> you can't really say it doesn't have a good um, source of natural vegetable dyes if you haven't actually done the experiments. So, so a favorite of mine is Edie Hart and she was a dye maker in Ballarat, Victoria. She, she came to Australia, she had a, a large number of children and she clearly uh, I think struggled in uh, providing for them. But she developed a natural dye range in her kitchen 
and marketed them as Hearts Australian Dies in 1921. She achieved great success and won international awards, but her company failed due to the vigilance and dominance of the German chemical dye companies in the local market. So I've been intrigued with Edie for a while, and in February, no, in March this year, visited the Gold Museum in Ballarat. The Gold Museum has now is in the process of changing to the Centre of Rare Arts and Forgotten Trades, uh, and it's in Ballarat, and Ballarat is the UNESCO City of Craft now, so I think those two things are linked. So online I found that Edie's scrapbooks and her typewriter were in the Gold Museum, so my visit to Ballarat, I took some snapshots, and these are photos. There's Edie on the left, a portrait of Edie. I don't have the date for the portrait. And this is Edie and her twin sister, Harriet Booth. So there, um, she does look quite stern and I could see her being very determined to set up a business and to take on uh, the dye companies because they were incredibly vigilant, the dye companies. Anyway, I don't know what she used her typewriter for because there were very few type notes in the museum that she had written. Other people had been... Um, translating and writing them up and typing them up. But her sketchbooks were incredible and a little disappointing. Uh, there were, I think there were four sketchbooks, a lot of them, and they were just exercise books. And a lot of them, the samples of fabric had been taken out. Uh, the curator at the Gold Museum thought it was her grandchildren or something that had taken the fa uh, fabric samples out. But I'm very suspicious of these colours. <laughs> and you probably agree. Like you can just see titles here. It says wild mushrooms on the very top. And the pink one says blood wood. Um, the bottom it says pine. And the tan, the one here, it says grass tree. On this one it says grass tree. Um, uh, Edie took orders and I think she over dyed a lot of materials. Like this placard of patterns material that she would have overdyed. But yes, some of them could be natural dyes, but like I don't know that I don't think they've ever been tested. There are recipes in her documents, but they're very loose recipes. And she did go, a lot of the documentation that's there is her um, efforts to have her recipes patented. And she had 12 different colours that she wanted patented, but she basically only had one, rec one recipe <laughs> and the patent's office weren't very interested in doing that. I think she did finally get it. But look, I did uh, take a lot of notes and photographs and I've got documents from um, March, my visit in March, but I really haven't spent a lot of time reading everything and I need to go through it thoroughly. But I still think Edie was a bit of a treasure in terms of this because she was so determined to do it. And from all the newspaper clippings that I've seen, she did have success with her hearts. There were hearts natural dyes and then she called them, I think, hearts royal dyes. Anyway, so that's Edie. And, um, yes, I my other typewriter looked very ancient and interesting. Uh, oh, one thing I think the curator said for Edie was that she was very keen to set up a production unit in Ballarat to give employment to returned soldiers from the First World War. That was one of the drivers for her wanting to do that. So um, Jean Carmen is a, also a great favourite of mine. And Jean... Uh, did a lot of research in the 70s and 80s. She start, she learnt, she was part of the Weavers Guild in, Bal in Melbourne and didn't take to weaving very much at that stage in the 70s, but did a dye class and she loved dyeing uh, the fabric. And then she really got totally involved. With her. her daughter also worked as a botanist, so I think that was another reason for being engaged. So she lived in Melbourne and then later... Um, moved to Brisbane and she was the one who shifted our understanding of eucalyptus dye colours 
She liaised with each state forestry department for leaves to be posted to her for testing, testing over, well, there's varying numbers, whether it's how many there are, but there are a lot, like um, how many, Catherine in her notes mentioned 450 species. Uh, that's a lot. Um, I've got a number here that's a little less. But anyway, what what Jean did was describe each of the colours that she tested. And she did, she tested them in her kitchen. And she published a book in um, 1978, Dye Making with Eucalyptus, uh, describing each colour, including some photographs that are shown. I've got next slide so here, including Jean dyeing and collating samples. So... At the end of her life, she was um, interviewed by Greg Borschman for the People's Forest Oral History, which is in the National Library in Canberra. This was in 1994. And this is a quote from her that I've used so much. That's the colours she found. The hidden beauty was just so unexpected and so rich in the colour tones of eucalyptus, wattles and other native plants. A beauty I never knew was hidden away in their leaves. I think it's very beautiful. Here's Jean in all her glory in a poncho, um, hand spun and woven with natural dyes and also with natural wool and then natural, um, some naturally dyed threads. And on the far side, uh, a sample card of a lot of the colours from eucalyptus. She doesn't really say what species was used here. But again, it shows the variety of colours. So the leaves, came, I've said mentioned before, they came from every state and also Papua New Guinea because her daughter went to work in Papua New Guinea and um, she was able to source eucalyptus leaves from there. And her book notes the location, botanical name, common name, the mordants used, and the resultant colour. So each colour was described only. So that's an important thing was she wrote about the colour. And she also wrote about the reds that were found in some eucalyptus. And she used her kitchen for her all of these experiments. So here she, some of her equipment and her dye pot and boiling. Actually, my, this is, I've got one dye pot identical to that. It used to be my mother's jam making pot. Um, So I think it's generally accepted that her documentation of eucalyptus was pioneering research and a remarkable achievement. Jean's experiments added considerable knowledge to Australian eucalyptus dyes, especially the reds. She listed 50 different species that gave red, so describing the colours as crimson, red rust, light red, orange tan or light orange. And here is... Um, um, some colour tests that, that she did for colour fastness. These are in the Queensland Museum. I've not seen them. Um, again, I did have a ticket, but I had to cancel it because of you know, what's happened in the last two years. But these are on the far side, you can see a slight variation in colour. So there are her light testings. She, she would have just exposed that section of the um, yarns to the light for a period of time. And I think. This one's Cinerea. I was trying to read it before without success. And um, these are also photos that were sent, snapshots that were sent to me from the Queensland Museum. But Jean, um, Jean was a Quaker and she really, she was um, given an award of Australia and for her Quaker belief, she nearly didn't accept, but she did accept. And she made a dress out of eucalyptus dyes. And these are photographs that the curator of the museum sent me. So I would love to go and see them. But on the top of the dress here, you can see the leaves at the shoulders. I think it's a great detail. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, this was in uh, 1991. And later on, she kept experimenting and doing different things with her dyes. And was this was when she was living in Queensland and did a lot of work at craft fairs and um, but promoting eucalyptus. And these are her screen prints and paintings with eucalyptus, her uh, hooked and fleeced rugs. And 
then this is a portrait of Jean painted with plant dyes. And I contacted Kerry Holland because when I was searching for Jean, her name came up because she um, painted this portrait in 1999. And Kerry said that she lived in the same area as Jean and she went to her house and then they went out to the local area and collected leaves and went home and boiled the colours up, the leaves up to have the dyes for the portrait. I thought it was very nice. But um, Jean also travelled quite a bit promoting eucalyptus. She went to China to discuss how they could develop um, eucalyptus forests for plant dyes. So she was um, she um, did a huge amount for the promotion of eucalyptus dyes. She also influenced um, other people to undertake uh, experiments and because the publication of her book coincided with an explosion of interest in craft and making by hand in the 1970s. And there's some people here that know about that, mm -hmm. um, including myself, I was influenced by that. It became a reference for my own natural dye experiments in 1978, when I dyed my own hand-spun wool yarn for my first weavings, and both were very lumpy, the wool and the weaving. Uh, but it's when I started weaving. And, um, Yes. So these people came after Jean and they all benefited by her research. So Kath Tindall in Western Australia published on Dyes of West Australian plant, Plants. It was a group project. And this um, her publication included illustrations and plants and the colours were described. The next two, Lorna Hindmarsh and ha Rob Harrington, documented research again in Western Australia. And the photographs here are from their publication and this is the first publication that I've seen with published colours linked to them to the eucalyptus. How accurate those colours are I don't know but basically it was the first I've seen. Then more recently India Flint who has, has uh, exceptional profile in terms of her um, work in plant dyes and uh, eco bundles and her publications. She tested over 200 species of eucalyptus plants from a Currency Creek Arboreum in South Australia and using eco prints and highlighting the potential of eucalyptus species as a source of dye colour. So, and uh, she's, as I mentioned, she's been very influential. She also thought that the, um, well, Jean, she thought, and she's, I've heard uh, India speak. Uh, of Jean, saying that she made a significant contribution to our knowledge of plant colours. Then uh, there's been two, the next two, Ling San Lu and Sally Blake, have published online databases of eucalyptus, uh, Lin San Lu in Tasmania and Sally Blake in Canberra. And Sally's uh, database is really remarkable. It's on her website. And she had funding to work with the uh, staff at the Australian National Botanical Gardens to test over 230 species, um, leaves and bark. That doesn't read very well. Anyway, she published her database in uh, 2016 and it's really it very clearly shows the difference in colours between using the same plant on different materials, different fibres, and the same plant with different mordants. And this is um, um, a thing that I've just made this connection because I've, uh, Sally is only, she sent me her um, coloured silk and wool. I sent her some silk and wool, I think in early March, and I received it a few weeks ago and I wove it uh, probably last week. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it was, amazing colour. Actually, I haven't given, uh, I meant to include a photograph of the silk and um, uh, wool that she dyed, but this is, this bit of wool here is the silk that she dyed. And this is with um, brittle gum, eucalyptus manifera. And the other side of the slide is more of my cochineal experiments. And I think it's really interesting that this res that Sally was able to achieve, it is on wool and wool takes colour exceptionally well. Most of the panels in my project are with silk, 
But in this year, I did ask three or four different people to dice them all, including so. Like, I think it's remarkable that really if experiments had been done very early in this country to test eucalyptus, they, they may have found a very viable way of uh, creating colour for the um, soldiers' uniforms from one of our local species. It's remarkable, I think, the colour that this red gives. So, I don't know what time it is. Gosh, I'll probably go quickly now. So um, the rest of the presentation is quite a, a bit on the Indian Ocean countries and then uh, the well, where the practitioners came from and it shows the panels that I wove from uh, those countries. I won't, um, most of the information is on the, on the screen and I'll just go over them quickly. But, um, and then there's some from the different states in Australia. I haven't had photographs taken of the most recent panels um, my life's got a bit too hectic and I got late in weaving. So these are all of the panels here are from the first 70. So for the Indian Ocean um, Ochak craft training, it was great to be able to contact people in other countries or uh, countries touched by the Indian Ocean. And I had a great response um, from most people. And there are a number of people that helped make those connections. So one of the very interesting things, sorry. Um, uh, I mentioned before Van Muller spreading it. So you could, he, most of these countries um, did receive uh, seeds from Van Muller, but the first sighting or the first reporting of eucalyptus growing in an Asian country was very early. Tipu Sultan, who is the ruler of Mysore, planted 16 species, eucalyptus species to beautify his palace gardens in the Nadi Hills near Bangalore in 1790. Now Australia was settled in 1788, so it's a very short period of time afterwards. But there is some dispute where uh, Tipu Sultan's seeds came from. Some say they came from Europe, and in that case they could have come from banks as various, well, um, Cook's very early visit here, um, or they may have come from Australia, but as I say, that's very quick uh, turnaround. So I thought that was fascinating that it was such a long time ago, and the, and he really wanted them to beautify his palace. And I did find reports that some of them were still growing um, a few years ago, like maybe eight or nine years ago, because there'd been a huge storm and some of the trees had been... Um, uh, wrecked in the storm and they were using the timber for local sculptors to make objects with. So they, whether they're still growing, I haven't been to investigate. So again, in the 40s and 50s, uh, 1840s and 1850s, there were more plantations done in India. So India was quite early in getting, um, being in, um, for eucalyptus to be introduced, but that was, I think, because of tea plantations. They're often used on tea plantations to, to beautify tea plantations. And so they were imported by planters with them. As a lot of those were British, so no connections there. But uh, generally they've influenced development in uh, a lot of these countries, growing in rotation as a cash crop. They have provided materials for firewood building, industrial purposes, railway sleepers, and the trees have been grown to act as windbreaks. And, but in some places, they are regarded as weeds to their invasive nature. And travelling in India, you see a lot of eucalyptus. So this is um, four panels from Aranya Natural, who are a fabulous um, social enterprise and welfare organisation in Kerala, and they work with differently able people. And as they um, produce textiles, died in the Japanese shibori technique. And I've been buying um, scarves and textiles from them for many years. So they dyed some silk specifically for me, but they use eucalypts normally in their color range and there are weeds in that area because it's tea plantation here, a beautiful country and the um, eucalyptus grow um, in the gullies and the ridges and the areas that can't grow tea. 
but these are the panels. These are the group of Pakistani artists and some I'd visited Pakistan many years ago and some were people I knew there and others were uh, people I'd found for, how do I get back, Catherine, sorry. On my keyboard? Yes, thanks. I've uh, just got to find my place. So the, the, uh, from Pakistan, so there are a number of people that I knew, but the one that was of great interest, Professor Tana Hussein from the National Textile University in Faisalabad was very happy to participate. And we had several emails. And in one, he mentioned that he had uh, dyed cotton and had sent it, but unfortunately I haven't received it. But I've read his research and his report, re, he's done a lot of research on to, using local eucalyptus for the, their textile industry. And their textile industry is huge with a lot of dyeing. And he, uh, he is, Professor Hussain is highly regarded for his dye research and testing for the Pakistani textile industry. And has found that the fastness properties of dyed cotton with eucalyptus were better than many of the commonly used chemical dyes. I'll keep going because I think I'm running late. Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. The Bangladeshi uh, group is um, Living Blue and they really were set up to use the indigo that was growing, still growing in Bangladesh after the British had planted it before partition. And that uh, organisation re revitalised and it's a fabulous artisan organisation training men and women in dyeing and stitching and making and for trading purposes. And uh, a group in South Africa who I didn't know but were introduced to. This is a photograph of all their beautiful parcels and little cards and gifts and stories, a map of where Claudia found her, the, um, where the tree was, a map of her village where the tree was growing, which she collected the leaves from. So they were great and they still, I still get posts and comments from them. Um, and again, um, eucalyptus plantings occurred there quite early in the early 1800s because um, there's a lot of communication between South Africa and Australia um, to do with the British occupation. Uh, and these are more from South Africa. And so Ira Becker, who's one of the, these artists, she said that she, she commented that she loves eucalyptus, but the others in her area view them as weeds. And Kirsten um, McClarty commented, she lives near, um, she, in, near Cape Town and her village has seven or so eucalyptus species growing with some over 120 years old and towering over the village. So I collected lovely little comments about them. And they did a lot of botanical printing, uh, direct printing from leaves to the fabric. Malaysia and Indonesia, Edric Ong, I wove a panel from. His is on the um, far side. There's now a second one of his in the exhibition, I think it is. I've got a second one of his too. Anyway, he's somebody that many people here would know because he's been very active in World Craft Council organisations. And so Edric and another artist, two artists from Indonesia are involved. Uh, from Western Australia, these are amazing colours. These are from Penny Jewel and Trudy Pollard. Both use plants growing on their property. And Trudy used silk that had been handwoven in Cambodia with a pro with a group that she's been involved in uh, assisting them set up the practice. And hers are the two on this side. I think they're incredible ranges of colours that they've been able to source. In the uh, catalogue in the exhibition, it tells you the plants that people have used. So more from Western Australia, including Anne Farron and Nada Searles and Annette. Annette Nyken, who's done a huge amount of work in this area. Then uh, Pat Torres, Lily Chan and Diane Chudnall from the Kimberley region. 
and from Victoria, more panels. She, and uh, some of these, uh, Sherry Haynes and Rebecca Mayo uh, had been in the original exhibition um, called Make the World Again. And um, some, the two second, the two on this side are from Harrisbrook, which is where my family have a farm and I was raised and I've collected a lot of plants from there. So in the exhibition, if there's no, if there's a place given for um, the, instead of a name, it means that I've collected the leaves and I've dyed the fabric and then I've woven it. And I've, there's quite a few, I've been meaning to add up how many, but I think there's about 20 maybe, maybe a few more that I've, I've done. Uh, ACT and New South Wales participants. On the far side is Chris Hutches and Chris has two panels and Chris has been great in helping me um, stitch all the labels onto all of the panels, a mammoth effort. More New South Wales, more reds. And this is how it looked with 29 panels. And some of you may have seen it already, but there's far more than this now. So it represents a very interesting community of practitioners, Weaving Eucalyptus Project, and a dialogue and collaboration with like-minded colleagues. Um, the colors give unique insights into place and location. And the project brings engagement, exchange, and the community together. And with it has been interesting. There are similar eucalypts being used from different places and clearly give different colors. And there are, in terms of Sally Blake's brittle gum, there are two. Um, Sue Hayes also used the same eucalyptus in her uh, dyeing, and they're quite different colors. So it depends on, but Sally did dye wool, and that makes a difference. So there's, the colour will be influenced by location, climate, drought, various things. Um, so I think that's it. Apart from here's the list of practitioners or collaborators. There are some here whose silks I haven't received or I haven't woven, but I still regard them as part of the project. Uh, but there's at least 60 individuals here and clearly a lot more from Australia. These are all my acknowledgements. So people helped with contacts, Kevin Murray and Jude Vandermeer. Um, I won't read them out, but there's been a lot uh, of people contacting, uh, helping me with contacts. And I did, I found some on, online and I knew a lot of them. Uh, Kevin Murray for the beginning of the project, Ian Holt for his photographs, Chris for stitching, and a huge thank you to the UNSW gallery staff, Jose, Karen, Catherine and Emily. They've been terrific to um, work with and cope with all my slight changes of text and late deliveries and various things, references. And there's another photo of that last, um, that composite photo of the, of the 29 panels. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to have so many questions. Five minutes. Um, do you get the reference from the dyers? What time they did it, the season, and the composition of the soil and the date? Because each climatic uh, area that you uh, collected, yeah. would that influence? It would influence, and I haven't been that thorough. Um, but I have asked them for information about the process what the plant was, and they usually tell me where they collected, they usually send me photographs. But look, I'm a practitioner, a weaver, I'm a very haphazard dyer, <laughs> so I'm not a specialist um, um, or doing it for very detailed research purposes, mm -hmm. like other than to create an installation. And also, like I haven't tried to have every eucalyptus in in included in a project and not like Sally, she included all the Euclid's in the ACT. Well, I think whether it was the ACT or the ACT Botanical Gardens, I'm not too sure. But yeah, no, I think that would have been a very good yes. guess. I have in the catalogue given the date of when I wove it. So there's one date there. And basically, there were two, I invited people at the end of 2018 
and so 2019 and asked them to deliver it by March 2020. And then I wove some then and then I wove a lot in the middle of 2020. I got my years wrong, I think. So I got a lot in 2020 for the Kevin's expedition and then the Indian Ocean Craft Training Group next year. And so I've invited people in different blocks, but not and a uh, silver card for them. Vince, am I right in understanding that you bought some of the plant material back from India? Too <laughs> deep. <laughs> I'm sure that was totally illegal. <laughs> On the trip in you. <laughs> so originally, um, I wrote to several people in India that I knew, and I also I've been going to India regularly, and I was in. Uh, Gujarat in December 2019, and I invited quite a few people there to um, the ice and silk. Me, I took quite a lot of silk timber, and everybody said, "No, no, no, we don't use eucalypts. We don't use them." So I, I so I started collecting. I didn't realize you had a suitcase full of <laughs> I had. <laughs> <laughs> I had only. I wasn't totally full. <laughs> I didn't have to think about it. I felt terribly guilty. Like you still see I'm guilty about doing it. But anyway, they didn't last long at home because they went into a dry pot. They got boiled up. Um, so, but I did from Gujarat and also from, from Western Wall from St. Timothy to a couple of other places. Because that really, like I've had a Rangi natural in India and two other people have died and sent me silk. So, you know, my, the country that I have a, and a lot of interest in and wanted to represent him, but she's going to be well represented unless I brought them these back. <laughs> so they're kind of, they're the ones, some of the ones that I've um, died as, as well as collecting leaves in Victoria. Mm -hmm. But yes, um, I didn't, I don't know, I hope there's no poor security. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, look, um, there are no other questions. Thank you for coming and enjoy the exhibition and the opening. And, oh, sorry. I, uh, I apologize. I came in a couple of minutes late. So if you've already addressed this, um, I apologize. But I was wondering uh, what kind of decisions you made on how to weave at the different. Yes, well, that was quite interesting. For some, I actually, in the beginning, uh, in November, late um, in November 2019, I made a decision to do this and I was. I contacted some people about 10 days before I went to India and I just had to make a decision. So I sent them two meters of silk fabric. So for all the Australian people, I provided the fabric. So I sent them two meters and I had this idea of what weaving the panels about 17 centimeters wide because I had done an earlier project related. I had done all the dyeing, but they were about 10 centimeters wide. Anyway, it just happened that two meters wove uh, a fat panel, 17 centimeters wide, uh, and, uh, to 120 long, or about 120. So, the majority of them, I'm aiming for a meter 20. So, that's, and it's just plain weave. I actually use plain weave. And I want this slightly wet face, so you see the predominance of the silk on the surface of the cloth. And it's a linen warp. And it's a very old linen thread that I bought over um, from a person who was selling old things. And it's been fantastic. It is strong. So it's Irish uh, linen and it's from Belfast. It's really, really strong. I yes, I've had some breaks in the walk, but it's been fantastic. And I've done eight walks on my night now and they've been about 20 meters or 24 meters long so it's been a little crazy. Don't ask me how many feet per centimeter there are how many times I've thrown the shuttle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I was wondering if you could give some context behind the bending. Um, is there any because I see differences in color and I'm trying to understand if there is any particular uh, rational or is it more an artistic decision? So um, the web stripe. So basically, with this project, I've got the web, the, the thread that I'm weaving with, which is a strip of fabric. Uh, that's all I've got to make um, the pattern or the colour. And yes, some of the fabric 
is very plainly patterned and often like this. Oh, with this one, these stripes here, the, the variation of this one, that would be in the fabric. And I've just ripped the fabric in starting one end and then the other, and I've woven in the same order. So all of that striping is in the way that it was dyed because it had a resist or they folded it or pleated it or knotted it. So others that, so this one here is pre patterned and that's dyed with. Uh, snow gun, what was the beauty of the term? Snow gun, and it uses four different mortars. Well, three mortars. It uses it's one color without mortar, like the lightest yellow is no mortar. The tan will be alum, the gray is iron, iron darkens a color. It's known as a fancy agent. Alum brightens it, and I think she used something else that I need to refer to. So I had these four different pieces, and so I had to make a, I made a decision about the striping. And I, like each one, as I mentioned, I wove as an individual piece. I've always woven, I've always used uh, web stripes, and I often, when I'm weaving, I imagine, you know, it's just like as I'm filling a ca canvas in front of my eyes, and I mean, this one tube woven something, it's in, it's in the cloth, and it's very hard to change. So I do imagine the amount of color that I'm going to weave with the yellow and the highlights. And this one, I think, actually, if you look at it closely, there's four different stripes and then there's colors that slip in through. I think that's the case. So quite, they're all done individually. And others, uh, so this is Ilka White. This one. So Ilka is a terrific artist and weaver and natural dyer. She lives in Queen Victoria. And she divided her two meters into, I think there's 12 different colors. And each one was beautiful. And she used three or four different eucalyptus plants. And with some of them, and she asked, she was about the only one who asked me, how wide is the weaving tip? And so she folded the fabric and dipped. One section of it into iron water to darken it. So the stripes here on the side, the first piece here. So I've woven it, ripped it and woven it just backwards and forwards. But half of it is tan and half of it's grey because she's dipped half of it into iron. Water. So and I just wove one per piece and then another and another and another. It did take a long time to decide the order of the colours though. Um, this one is Joe Cows, and Joe's an master student here, and her panel is just information about her practice outside. She's done a lot of experimentation with mordants. She paints or three prints mordants onto fabric, so it's half a dozen different mordants in different combinations, and then she dyes it in a dye pot and gets an amazing range of colors. And so this was like outside is a photograph of her striped top. So hers was. Stripes, and then when this is what it was like when it was really well, still stripes, but very different. Anyway, um, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. It's all random, and I read randomly too, and I like that element, and I love the element in the installation of the installation because they're essentially in the order that I wanted them, not strictly, mm -hmm. but essentially, and that's a nice random element too. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, oh, Cecilia. <laughs> um, thank you for this talk. It's so inspiring. Mm -hmm. It would be so wonderful to get funding, and there's so much poetry in your work. You know that relationship between mm -hmm. It'd be beautiful to get funding and have the response of the people who died the cloth as to. You know, because it would be a surprise as to how the results came out. So, if, you know, yes, technical is completion, but there's a lot of poetry and narrative. Mm -hmm. And I think, like, some yeah. of their notes to me are really beautiful, like right? text and all, and their comments. So, yes, I always have more comments. I'm not going to have a guy in the fun. But um, I have, um, I've got a website, half website. It would be a complete website at some stage. But I am wanting to put more the catalogue there 
because in my original catalog I had I had a description for the uh, diet and then a description for the process, which is in the catalog here, and then a photograph. And I've been really keen to sort of have that available for people. But thank you for doing that very nice compliment. <laughs> 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 But it's been terrific in terms of engagement. One girl I had, this has been lockdown, I had 20 or so emails from her. And she just, every day there would be another person, and it wasn't as that. She just, with this amount of communication, that was interesting. That's what I feel like it's uh, created within the community. Um, so oh. I'll be here at the opening with anybody yeah. else. Thank you for coming and enjoy the project. <laughs> Thank you so much, Liz. That was really fascinating. Um, yes, please join us um, at UNSW Galleries where we're celebrating the opening of um, a project from Liz and also from Big Chu and Anoka Samara Sekera. Um, so yeah, please go over there and enjoy our hospitality. Thank you. And the jewelry exhibitions are fabulous. Really mm, fabulous. Three really fabulous. beautiful, beautiful and projects. In the gallery, there's five or planes with, Ka with Catherine and her colleague, Karen Hall, is a curator. And it's a, a contemporary art piece, I think. It's, I would highly recommend it. Excellent. It's taken a, the title from Annie Alvarez's life. So that's a worthwhile edition. Thank you. It is. It'll be open as well. Thank you, everyone. I'll just end the live stream.